Uh, g good morning. I want to talk, uh, of course, about the National Flood Insurance Program, the FIP. Uh, as we all know, it expires on July 31st. That's in eight calendar days, including today. Um, to allow this program to expire would be bone deep down to the marrow stupid. I think most members of Congress and most members of the Senate understand that. As you know, uh, all of us have been working hard to reform the program. Um, I, along with Senator Rubio and Senator Warren and Senator Menendez, um, have, a, have a bill in the Senate uh, to try to fix the problems in the program. Uh, Senator Cassidy and Senator Gillibrand also have another bill. We're working together to try to meld the provisions of our bill. But we're not going to get the reforms done by July 31st. Uh, all of the congressional delegation is working very hard to get the Senate and the House to agree to extend the program. Now, I would like to extend it for uh, six months. And what we're proposing is just extend the status quo. That's it. Just extend the status quo for six months uh, to allow us to continue to negotiate. Uh, we're, we're, we're taking uh, several approaches to try to accomplish that. Number one, I added an, a rider to the Farm Bill, which has passed the Senate and the House, which would extend the program, maintain status quo for six months. The problem with uh, getting that done by July 31st is that the bill's got to go to conference committee, and then a re conference report has to be done, and then the, the conference report has to come back along with the uh, amended bill to, to the Senate and the House. To, for concurrence, and I don't know if we'll get that done by July 31st. In fact, it's highly unlikely. Um, in addition to that, uh, I've introduced, along with Senator Cassidy, a standalone bill that would extend, again, just maintain the status quo, that would extend the NFIP for six months. That's Senate Bill uh, uh, 3128, I believe. Senator, or rather, uh, Congressman Scalise over in the House uh, is, is introducing and has introduced another measure that would maintain the status quo, just to extend the current program uh, for another uh, uh, four months. Hopefully we can meet somewhere in the middle. The, the problem we're having in the mo at the moment in the Senate is that there are three senators who are objecting and they're raising their right to filibuster. Um, they all three say that they want reforms. Well, we all want reforms, but we're not going to get those reforms in, into a bill that's going to pass the Senate and pass the House and be signed by the President by July 31, which is the point I have tried gently and in some cases not so gently to make uh, to my colleagues. I respect their right to object, uh, but I'm, they need to respect my right to use all of my power as a United States Senator to raise all kind of hell and do everything I can to, to keep this program uh, from lapsing. And uh, we're trying to do it in a collaborative way, but I'm prepared to go over them if I can't go with them. And Senator McConnell, the majority leader, has been very cooperative in helping us achieve that goal. I, I, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir, to, to allow this program um, to lapse in the middle of hurricane season, I, I mean, it's just unconscionable. Um, it'll impact five, uh, five million Americans that have flood insurance. Uh, there are 500,000 Louisianians that have flood insurance. Uh, some of my colleagues, uh, uh, coincidentally, I'm sure, who don't live near water, uh, think that uh, the answer, of course, is just to move. If you live near water, well, just move. Uh, I've tried to remind them that 50% of America's jobs are along our coast and waterways. 
people have been uh, settling and opening businesses near water uh, uh, since Moby Dick was a minna. Uh, I mean, it's, we've always, civilization has always uh, located near water. So has commerce. I'm also pretty tired of hearing that the National Flood Insurance Program is just for rich people trying to protect their beach homes. That's a bunch of bovine waste. Uh, if you look at the statistics, 98.5% of all people who are carrying uh, flood insurance live in counties with a median household income below $100,000 a year. They don't have beach homes. And 62% uh, of, uh, of Americans uh, who carry flood insurance live in counties with a median household income below $54,000, which is the national average. Um, I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic. I don't want to overpromise here. Where I think we're going to go right up to the line, uh, but we're doing everything we can to extend this program. I want to reassure people that if Congress stupidly allows the program to lapse, uh, it won't affect those who've already purchased insurance. Now, you won't be able to renew your insurance if it lapses while the program has expired. And, of course, you won't be able to, uh, to buy new insurance if you're, a, if you're a, a first time purchaser. It'll also have a huge impact on our housing market. Uh, it'll, I mean, it'll probably shut down about 1,000 to 2,000 closings across America every day. That's what happened back in 2010 when Congress allowed the, uh, the program to expire. So that's where, how we all, where we are, rather. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Matt, you want to go ahead? Yeah, Senator, this has been temporarily extended six times mm -hmm. now. What gives you the confidence that a seventh will actually you know, get something done? Well, I think the vast majority of members of Congress, including the House and the Senate, understand the importance of the flood insurance program. Uh, we had a non-binding vote. I don't want to get too technical here, but we had a non-binding binding vote on a motion to instruct a conference committee uh, on July 12th to extend the program. Ninety-four senators voted for it. So we're, we're only talking about a handful of people who are objecting. Um, again, 50 percent of this, this country's jobs are located near water. And even if you're not located near water, if you get 21 inches of rain in two days, as we did in, in 2016 in Louisiana, uh, you're going to flood. I don't care if you live on Pikes Peak. And, and, but now, now there are some problems in the program, and we're, we're trying to fix those. But we're trying to do it, at least I am, in a way that strikes a balance between uh, fiscal stability p for the program, but affordability for the people who buy the insurance. I mean, the whole purpose of the flood insurance program is to provide flood insurance. It doesn't do any good if you, if you uh, uh, set the premium so high that nobody can afford it. So that's what we're working through, and I'm confident that, uh, that, that we'll eventually get it done. But we don't have it done yet. And while my colleagues who are objecting say, well, we want reforms, hell, so do I. But we're not going to get them done by July 31. But I do believe we'll eventually uh, get them done if we have a little more time. Brad. Yeah, Senator, uh, if you would, just kind of speak to the importance of that program to uh, Louisiana families. To, to the what, Fred? The Louisiana families who endure hurricane season after hurricane season. Well, we, we've, you know, we've learned the hard way in Louisiana that uh, flood insurance, is, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's a necessity during hurricane season. It's a necessity outside of hurricane season. You don't have to be in hurricane season to get 21 inches of rain in two days. Now, the reason a, a lot of people uh, don't carry it is be, because they can't afford it. And we're working on that uh, to, to try to be able to lower premiums or at least keep them from rising so dramatically. 
We're also working on reforms to expand the coverage uh, so that if you do carry flood insurance, uh, you, you can buy insurance up to $500,000. We're also trying to expand the coverage by educating people on why they need to carry it and, enfor and, and uh, reforms to enforce the provisions of folks who are required to carry it and aren't carrying it. Uh, and there, there are a lot of reforms that we're working hard on, but we don't have 60 votes in the Senate yet. And until we, uh, we do, we can't pass the bill. Uh, but just because we haven't been able to work it out to this juncture doesn't mean you ought to just kill the whole program. You know, I, I mean, that to me is just, uh, is just it, it, well, it's, it's why I heard when I ran for this job, I heard people say it all, all, all the time. They say, you know, people would tell me in, in so many words, we think there's some good members of Congress. We just can't quite figure out what they're good for. Now, that, that point of view is going to become uh, uh, quite the reality if we let this program expire. Rob? Hey, Senator Kennedy, Rob Maston, Fox 8, New Orleans. Yeah, Rob. I'm just wondering, are, are there any elements to reform that are currently taking shape that might secure the long-term funding for this program so that we can get away from these constant stopgap measures? Well, my bill does a couple of things. First of all, it caps rate increases at 10 percent a year. Right now, they can jack up the premiums by as much as 18 percent a year. Um, my bill would, would save money by reducing the amount that we're paying private insurance companies to administer the program. As you know, FEMA is in charge of the program, but FEMA doesn't administer it. It hires private insurance companies to administer the program, to handle the claims, to sell the insurance, that sort of thing. But those private insurance companies don't have any risk, and they're being paid 31 cents out of every premium dollar. They don't have any risk. Uh, 27, 26, 25 cents sounds a lot better to me. The money we would save could be used to pay down the program's debt, and it could also be used to, uh, to spend money on mitigation. We've also learned the hard way in Louisiana and elsewhere that, that uh, a, pa a pound of prevention is worth a or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now, I mean, mitigation makes sense. That's why uh, Senator Cassidy and I worked so hard over here in, uh, in the Senate to get money for the uh, Comet River Diversion Canal, for example. I I'm also uh, putting in a provision uh, in the law in under my reform bill to try to streamline the claims process. Uh, it's, it's way too complicated. I'm, I'm putting a provision, we'll have a provision in our bill to try to rein in some of these consultants, these lawyers and, and engineers who, uh, after a flood, do everything in their earthly power to keep people from getting their money. Um, you know, if, if you pay your hard-earned money for flood insurance and you flood, you ought to get your money. And, and you shouldn't have to fight engineers and lawyers and file a federal court lawsuit in order to get paid, and that's being abused. Uh, my bill also would allow locals, local representatives, councilwomen, councilmen, levy board members, local officials, to uh, have more say in the program. They, they know their land better than a bureaucrat in Washington, uh, uh, D.C. And finally, um, uh, the bill that uh, I'm sponsoring would uh, would call for the highest uh, state of technology for mapping. A lot of our maps are inaccurate. We've learned a lot since they were drafted. And, and uh, I think uh, technology can help us do a better job. But we're not there yet. And we need more time. And I know we've had other extensions. We may need another extension after this. Eventually, we'll get it done. Uh, I, I get frustrated at the pace at which uh, the United States Senate works. I want to gallop, but in the Senate you have to, an inch, have to inch along. And the reason for that is you, you need 60 votes to do just about anything, certainly to pass a reform bill for flood. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. That doesn't mean you take your, your toys and go home. That doesn't mean that you say, well, we haven't been able to achieve it, so let's just let the program expire. Boy, that'll show them. Yeah, it'll show them, all right. It'll, it'll show the American people how stupid we are. 
correct? Um, yeah, Senator Sagan, um, the Senate's going to be staying in for part of August, but the House is getting ready to leave. So if they pass the four-month expansion, um, you know, is the Senate just going to have to go along with what, what they're doing, even though you've expressed your preference for a six-month extension? Well, uh I want to thank uh, Congressman Scalise. He's just been a champ over in the House. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and every American Louisianian ought to thank him for his efforts on this. If the best we can do is four months, I'll take it. Now, I still would prefer the six months because we do have a lot, of more, work, a lot more work to do. But if the best we can do is four months, I'll take it. Brian? Yeah, Senator, this is uh, Bryn with The Advocate. Um, yeah, Bryn. Your options to uh, get this through the Senate if you can't get unanimous consent? Uh, if I can't get unanimous consent, well, I don't want to put all my cards on the table, Bryn, but if I can't get unanimous consent, we're working on a way to just basically bust through the unanimous consent. File cloture, uh, do what we have to do to keep the program from expiring. And if we, uh, and I think we can get it done by July 31. If we can't, we can't. But that's all we can we can do at this juncture. If we can't get it done by July 31, we'll only miss it by a couple of days. And the and the uh, the people who are making unrealistic demands in the Senate, in my judgment, will just have to accept the responsibility. Um, uh, but it but it would be, I, I'm hoping that they will relent. Um, I've, I've done everything I can to try to convince them, um, including but not limited to repeatedly kissing a part of their anatomy. Uh, that's part of my job sometimes up here. And I, let me say it again. I respect their right to object, but their objection is we want reforms. Well, first, they haven't told us what reforms they want, and number two, uh, it's the program expires in eight days, for God's sakes. Duh! We can't pass a bill in the Senate and the House and go to conference and have it signed by the President in eight days. It's just physically, legally impossible. Drew, last question. Yes, Senator Drew Broach at the PQ. Who are these three Senate holdouts? I'm, I'm not going to name names. I, I, I don't want this isn't about personality. Um, it, let me say it again. It is their prerogative to object. I respect that. I've objected on bills myself, uh, and I respect their right to object. But they have to respect my right to say they're just wrong, and they are wrong. And what they're asking for here is totally unreasonable. And there's no way we can give them what they wanted. If, if, they, were, if they were asking for, well, uh, I'm, I don't agree with the amount of time. I could sit down and work with them. But for them to say, well, we want to reform the program and we want to do it in eight days, um, you know, that's just totally unreasonable. And I can't, and I, I'm going to, I've got to call it out. But, but I want to emphasize this isn't personal. Um, I just disagree with them. And I'm going to fight like hell to beat them. Michelle, can we get one more in on Kavanaugh? Yeah. Sure, one more. Senator. Rob, again with Fox 8, yeah, you're, meeting with, uh, Brett, you're meeting with Brett Kavanaugh this afternoon. What yes. are your initial impressions of him, sir, and, and what do you hope to find out uh, in this meeting? Well, I, I, as we all do on judiciary, I take my confirmation hearings very seriously. Uh, I have started uh, reading Judge Kavanaugh's past works. Uh, I've started with his law review articles. I'm reading one now that he wrote about statutory construction and interpretation. When I finish his law review articles, I'll start on his main opinions. He's written 300 opinions, um, concurrences and dissents as well. And I doubt I'll get through all of them by the time we hold hearings, because I hope we hold hearings by the third week of August. I, I really don't uh, expect to spend a lot of time with him today talking about the law. I, I just I want to know what's in his head. I want to know what's in his heart. I want to know... Uh, I want to know how he views the world. Uh, I, I want to understand, uh, just in a general way, what he sees the role of the United States Supreme Court as being in our society. 
the U.S. Supreme Court has become very politicized. Part of that is the responsibility of Congress. We made the confirmation process um, uh, uh, very politicized. Uh, I mean, some of my colleagues want to be able to go in there and say, okay, how are you going to vote on abortion? How are you going to vote on gun control? Uh, how are you going to vote on the First Amendment? How are you going to vote on, on reasonable suspicion under the Fourth Amendment to, to Constitution? Obviously, I'd like to know the answers to those questions, but it would be inappropriate to ask, and here's why. The Supreme Court doesn't decide abstract political questions. They don't get together on a Tuesday and say, okay, today we're going to vote on abortion. Uh, they do make policy as a result of deciding specific cases. But the policy that the U.S. Supreme Court makes is within the confines of a case. And it's guided substantially by precedent. It's not supposed to be a political process. Uh, judges are supposed to call the balls and the strikes. Now, in doing that, do they sometimes make policy? Yes. But if you want to be an ideologue and go make sweeping policy and rewrite the Constitution every other Thursday to try to advance some personal political agenda, then you shouldn't be a judge. You need to go run for Congress or President. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.